So uh, uh, let's, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Faisal Saeed Al Mutar. I'm the president of a new organization called Ideas Beyond Borders. Uh, the mission of Ideas Beyond Borders is to create and promote a positive counter narrative to reduce or prevent extremism. Um, we are starting with the Arab world because it's my safe space. That's where I'm from, and that's one of most of the region I'm familiar with. Um, so I, I come, as I said, I come from a small town called Baghdad. It's the, just the south of the Mississippi River over here. Uh, that's where I was born. I grew up there until 18 years old, and then I moved all across the region, to, from Syria to Lebanon to Turkey to Malaysia and Southeast Asia and then the United States. I get an award from President Obama in 2016 for my work to engage with Muslim communities uh, in the United States. And I'm the founder of multiple platforms. Uh, one of them, I think some of the people who came here are familiar with, the Global Secret Humanist Movement, which has about 400,000 subscribers and millions of visitors from 136 countries, so pretty much everywhere except ISIS. I don't think I have fans there. Um, and engaging in subjects related to expression, counter extremism, secular thought, and universal human rights. But previously, I used to work with a project started by Google Ideas, um, and I was the program manager for the Middle East and North Africa to assist. So we created uh, what's sometimes called the Match.com for Human Rights in which people make requests from closed societies, and we match them with experts who have skills in open societies to help them. So if, say, you are a women's rights activist from Afghanistan, want to get coverage, you are a, a writer or a blogger covering women's stories in Afghanistan, we match, them dot, uh, we match them together. And my background is digital marketing, computer science, and this is one of the things that I'm very much interested in, is how can we utilize technology to solve social problems and, most importantly, the problem of extremism. So this is a bit of my background. This is my first talk at uh, Oklahoma State University. It's my second time in Oklahoma. Last time I gave a talk at Tulsa. And so before we get started, how many of you are lived in the Middle East? I know the organizer is, um, or st studied, I think you study something related to the Middle East. So probably you have an idea about the region. So this is uh, the diagram of the geopolitical relationships of the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's from the Institute for Internet Diagrams. Uh, and what I love a lot about this diagram, which is pretty simple, I mean, it doesn't really need explanation, is that the Palestine and Israel were discounted for the sake of simplicity. <laughs> so um, while this might actually sound funny to some of you, this actually is not that far from reality. So the, the, that is from 2015. I will show the slide afterward for 2016 and 17. So that's friend, foe, and uncertain. So uncertain is sometimes things switch, uh, as we, can, we have seen in some parts of Syria. So, so I, mean, th I mean, the Middle East can be explained in the most simplest way um, that there is some sort of a civil war happening between Iran on one side and the Arab Gulf states on the other. And, and you have these three, I mean, three major battlefields are Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. So what you see is that there are some groups from all over. So some of these names that I mentioned here are militias, not, so they're non-state actors, and some of them are state actors. So you have Houthis, for example, have support from Iran to fight against Sunni militias inside Yemen that are supported by Saudi Arabia. With Qatar, they have supported the Muslim Brotherhood against now the recently elected again, Sisi, who won 99% of the votes. I probably must be very lacked over there. I was really shocked to hear that CC won. I mean, I had no idea that he would. And, uh, and then you have groups like Hezbollah. So Hezbollah has multiple branches across the region. There is one in Iraq, one, one is fighting currently in Syria, and one in Lebanon that has direct support from Iran fighting against mostly uh, Sunni uh, militias in, in the rebels. And this is uh, another recent picture from Syria in the latest uh, war in Afrin, in which this is the Free Syrian Army, which is a, a rebel group north of, uh, uh, north of Syria that has, I don't know if you can see that, but this is a Turkish flag on the left. So Turkey has been recently very much involved in supporting many of the Sunni militias operating inside, inside the nation. And this is, um, so we'll go back to another, this is a more, this is one of the most recent 
geopolitical um, diagrams that, that doesn't discount uh, Israel and Palestine for the sake of simplicity, but rather includes it. And that, in that way, here includes a country like Bahrain, who s uh, has support from Saudi Arabia and many of the other Gulf states in curbing some of the Bahraini opposition, which is mostly made of, of, of Shias. And then, and, you, uh, so, and then you have Hamas, which is supported. So, so, so it, like the Middle East can really mainly explained by um, that there are three major powers, which is, which is um, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and you can add to it Qatar, who is also involved in, in some of the battles. So are you confused? It's pretty simple, huh? Um, so what happened? And I'm not talking about Hillary Clinton's book. So I'm, I'm going to explain to you, uh, from my uh, understanding and research, what really happened in the region over the past um, years. And there was... In, in, in according to multiple research of people in counter extremism and, and political science is that there, are, there has been three major political movements that started after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And after the fall of World War I, in which when the Ottoman Empire started with the, uh, the Axis at the time or the enemies of the Allies and then lost and then the, most of the Middle East has been divided into British and French colonies. And and there was one of the years that are considered one of the most important years in Middle Eastern history, which is near 1979 and also 1948, in which is the creation of the State of Israel. So there has been three major movements that rose uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire that kind of tried to recreate a new identity after the fall of one of the most major Islamic empires of our time that have had control of a vast amount of, of land. And, so the first movement is the Arab nas nationalist and socialist, and sometimes those who are mixed, uh, national socialists. And it's made of Amar Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, one of the most major figures, so that's him. Um, and then you have some people like Yasser Arafat, uh, who, who is also an Arab nationalist and advocated for more of an Arab state, uh, Arab nationalism as a, as a form of opposition to Israel's existence. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the guy who ruled Iraq for more than three decades, Saddam Hussein, and there is obviously uh, the, the, the Ba'ath Party of Syria with Hafez al-Assad, and now is Bashar al-Assad, who is his son ruling, and Qaddafi of Libya, who, who, I mean, many people confuse Arab nationalists with secularists, but from many, many of the histories that many of these people actually switch sides once in a while. And for example, with Saddam Hussein, even though he started as a secularist Arab nationalist in the beginning, but then after the first Gulf War, he took a more on Islamist route, and he is the one who put Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag and declared more Iraq to be a more Islamic state. So while from the outside they might appear to be more secular in nature, but they also are very much constrained by lots of the geopolitics of the region. With Assad, even though he started as a secularist and now after the rise of the civil war, you'll see that he's siding with Hezbollah and Iran Many of these states are theocratic in nature. So there are sometimes that Arab nationalists, even though they have a, some sort of secular platform by comparison to others, they also follow Islamist trends because it is very, sometimes very necessary for pure geo geopolitical uh, reasoning and also for staying in power. As also we are s seeing in the case with um, uh, the latest counter prince of Saudi Arabia in which he's trying to introduce some reforms. There have been many discussion about that. Um, I think one of the main reasons why he's trying to is because Saudis were able to create a beast that they cannot control and for them, for the royal family to be able to maintain to stay in power, they have to push for reforms because otherwise the people that they have taught in the madrasas inside Saudi Arabia, inside um, multiple parts of the region will actually made a, make a revolution against them. So, so many of, of, I mean, the reason why they can be considered a separate group than the Islamists, even though they are, they might have Islamist tendencies, is because they are more viewed as rational actors. So they, they are more viewed as they do cost-benefit analysis that is materialistic in nature, that doesn't uh, correlate to the existence of heaven and hell, uh, uh, etc. So, so the second movements, um, or the, the two and third movements, that are really have created, created after the fall of the Ottoman Empire and World War I, which is the, the Sunni Islamists and the Shia Islamists. So the, the Sunni Islamists, I mean, 
Muslim Brotherhood is one example. There has been multiple examples. Um, most of the works of the Islamist groups of Sunni Islamists is that the recreation of another of an Islamic caliphate, uh, the creation of another identity after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, um, and some of them. So I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is viewed as violent by many analysts and viewed as none. But I I try to separate it from the violent Islamists because there are sometimes possibilities in which the Muslim Brotherhood engages in less in more of a democratic process as we have seen in Tunisia, for example, in which they were able to, to, to downplay some of their Islamism and try to engage more in the democratic sphere in the country. And then you have violence on the Islamists like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Qatar, Omar, um, I mean, Boko Haram, and, and uh, even it's not in the Middle East, but it's following similar ideology as, as ISIS, as they have pledged allegiance, and there is Abu Sayyaf group in, in, uh, in Asia. And also with Shia Islamists, so the Dawah Party in Iraq is one of the leading opposition groups during the Saddam regime. Um, the Dawah Party was also responsible for creating the revolution. Sometimes it's called Intifada Sha'baniya, started in 1991 after the fall of after the first Gulf War, um, in which many of them were engaging in opposition and a war against Saddam Hussein. At the time, there was kind of a pre-Arab Spring situation in which there was a revolution happening from the south of Iraq and the north of Iraq from the Kurds. And the goal was to uh, get Saddam out of power. And what happened is that Saddam was able to maintain some of the power. The, 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 there was a, a, a term called Mahavad al-Bayda, which is the, um, the whites, well, white is not white privilege, but white uh, um, promises in which Saddam, which are the Sunni provinces that Saddam was able to maintain power at, which is to create Ambar, and then was able to defeat Hizb al-Dawah in the south, but were not able to defeat the Kurds in the north, and that's why the north were able to stay as an autonomous region. And then there is the violent Shia Islamists, who are example is the Islamic Republic of Iran, at least the militia is involved with them, um, which is from the Republican forces, and then as I mentioned, Hezbollah in Lebanon, as well as getting involved in Syria, Badr movement, which has a militia, and previously Jesh al Mahdi for, with Muqtad al Sadr and many other militias. So, this is this are example of um, uh, uh, one of the Shia violent, violent Shia Islamists or the one who have succeeded. So, there was a main major article, a major research done on this specific year, 1979, which is, I think, a very defining year in the Middle East. So, the Saudi government, actually, with the help of Pakistan and uh, France, so France were sending uh, soldiers there and the government of Pakistan was sending soldiers there. The Saudi king actually did the reverse. So even though they have killed the, the group, so you would think that the Saudi king would, would try to make sure that they are, no, none of them would be existed again. He said, maybe the solution for the, uh, for the Khwana group, which is the extremist Islamic group, is to actually have more religion. So to some extent, he made kind of a compromise with the ideology of that group that he defeated, which is the Khwana group. And, and Saudi Arabia moved to a much more conservative, um, and, 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 and that's from the book Inside the Kingdom, in which it, it moved to a much more conservative theocratic government. So, so, so in 1979, the two major regional powers that we have right now um, became theocratic in, in, a, in a way and became more involved and expansionist in the region, and that are causing many of the conflicts today. And there, there is one of the major uh, years, in, again, 1979, which is the Soviet, Soviet Afghan war, in which Saudi Arabia became much more influential in politics to spread their Salafist ideology as a counter narrative to two major rising powers, which is Iran from the Iran Revolution and then the Soviet Union. So they were major supporters of many of the groups that were fighting against the Soviet, Unions, the Soviet Union. And then and the United States, because mainly because of the Cold War that was happening against the Soviet Union and also because of the Iranian hostage crisis, the United States was giving Saudi Arabia much more free pass in, in achieving their ideology. So, so let's talk about positive stuff. Um, uh, uh, I mean, golden retrievers are some of my favorite dogs. And, and um, so I've been also researching on, because as I've said, like, most of what I was talking about was really negative stuff of what's happening in the region um, in a more negative way. So Tunisia. So Tunisia has, has been one of really countries that have been very focused on, because in my opinion, it's one of the only few countries, actually the only country in the Arab Spring that had what I refer to as a successful revolution. Um, in which, um, so there's, there are some of the, the facts about Tunisia. So you have some of the statistics 
that more 99% of Muslim Tunisian women are literate, the enrollment rate of, of women is higher than all of the surrounding neighbors pretty much, and I'll obviously add Iraq and, and Syria into that list as well, even though we are not um, surrounding to Tunisia. And even their Islamist party, which is the Nahda party, was able to uh, semi-modernize. I mean, obviously I still have my criticism of them, but they, they still said that women have the right to wear whatever they want, including bikinis, and that's from the leader of the Nahda party, which is, in my opinion, something revolutionary by comparison to other Islamist groups, in, including Iraq and Egypt and, and others. And, and from, from the, uh, this book, uh, from the Encyclopedia of African Afri American Experience, so there's something that's really interesting happened in Tunisia. And, and according to another book called Tunisian Arab Anomaly by Columbia University, so they this, this, this cut one of the main founders of Tunisia, and his name is Bourgeba. While he was himself, uh, and obviously more dictatorship-like, but he is one of the very few dictatorships in the whole region that limited military spending and allocated most of the national budget to education, agriculture, and health. So by comparison to all other dictatorships in the region, so if you look at Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, in which he doubled, not only doubled, but tripled military spending and go on multiple wars across the region, Saddam Hussein, Tripled military spending, go on a war with Iran. Um, he was one of the only few, except he's the only exceptional case in which he he was like, okay, let's let's calm the hell down, and let's try a different policy in which we try to invest in our people and not go on multiple wars from with countries like Israel or many other places. So he 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 focused on what some calls the cultural element of cultural development of country, in which he invested more in education, more, more in arts, um, agriculture, considering that, that Tunisia is a country that with not many resources, they're not unlike other parts of the Middle East in which there's multiple resources like oil and gas. Um, so he invested more in his country. And it doesn't surprise to me, it doesn't surprise me that this is actually what we had. It doesn't surprise me at all that the revolution that happened in Tunisia, which was the first time, the first part of, of the Arab Spring, was really done on a similar path as, to some extent, the French Revolution and others, because you have a very highly educated population in which most people really cared about things like economics and build, had, say, materialistic reasons of why they were doing the revolution, compared to other parts of the region in which some of the revolutions were motivated by sectarianism and, and others. So, for example, I, I, even though I'm in university and I need to curse, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is uh, there is this example from FDR, um, and he was asked about why did he support the Nicaraguan fascist dictator, and then he said he could be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. And what's happening is that for both part, uh, if you look at the difference between Iraq and Syria, is that both Islamists, the Shia Islamists, you are supporting Assad right now, who is a dictator from the Ba'ath Party, and you see the Sunni Islamists love Saddam Hussein. Who was, so what, uh, who was a Sunni dictator. So what it means is that for many of these Islamists, they didn't really care much about Saddam or Assad being a dictator or anti-civil liberties, or they cared about them not being hit their own son of a bitch. So while in countries like Tunisia, in which most of the revolution was dealt by, led by working class, people who cared about um, better living and education, to some extent materialistic reason, that's why we have some of the uh, success stories. So here is my radical idea, uh, which I've learned from, from countries like Tunisia, because I, I don't want to use examples in the Western world, because there are obviously different cultures, different languages. So that if, if more people being introduced to different set of ideas, as we have seen in Tunisia, other than set of values, one of set of values, as we have seen in both Iran and Saudi Arabia, which are major exporters of extremism, it can increase Curiosity, critical thinking, and reduced dogmatism. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the premise is that, is that the extreme interpretations of any faith, and if you are introduced to only one set of values, dogmatism leads to extremism, and extremism leads to terrorism. And, 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 and the way that I view terrorism is that it's, it's more like AIDS, that it's, it's more like the symptom of the problem, not the disease itself. So extremism, for extremism to grow, it needs an ecosystem that 
to, to, to exist, which is not limited, which is not limited to. So I mean, the the education aspect. I mean, when you, when you grow up in a country like Egypt and even parts of Iraq or even Saudi Arabia, and you are constantly taught that there is there is a there is a glory in recreating the caliphate. These are the things that all Muslims should strive for, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a surprise that many of them join extremist groups it's because that is the culture that was the education system in many of these countries has created this ecosystem for lots of these extremist mentality to grow. But that being said, for also for extremist groups like ISIS and like many of these violent groups, they need things also like chaos and you know, what's happening with with U.S. intervention in Iraq, which was not organized to say the least, um, and I'm being positive by saying not organized, um, and you have concepts like political polarization in which many of the political parties have sectarian roots. So, for example, when the U.S. withdrew from Iraq, the prime minister of Iraq, Nur al-Maliki, decided to cut down many of the salaries of the Sunni opposition to ISIS, which were called the Sons of Iraq, or al-Sahwa, the Awakening Forces. Um, and then, as a result, because of political polarization, many Sunnis from where I come from, from West Baghdad and West Iraq, felt that they cannot engage more in the political process because they think it was too polarized. And that's not in any way justification of why they did what they did. But, but political polarization is generally a reason why you see many of the extremist groups grow. And then you have authoritarian regimes like Assad and others who constantly bomb people and indiscriminately and allows groups like Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS to say, I'm going to defend you against this barbaric uh, dictator who is bombing the hell of us. And then you have anti-modernity and, 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 and the, the, the generally conservative movement, which is, has a lot of anxiety and fear from change. So the, the, the Islamist movements and, and others also were created as a kind of an opposition to the globalization and the modernization of the world. Um, this is, I mean, if you look deeply to the books of the Hassan al-Banna, Sayyid Qutb, and founders of the Muslim Brotherhood, who one of the funny stories is, is, I mean, one of them studied in the United States. So I think he went to Colorado, if I'm, if I'm not I mistaken. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and then in, in his book, uh, one of his, he was talking about women dancing in church. And, that's, and he was probably horny. Um, and um, he, he thought he condemned that, and he thought that is one of the worst ideas could ever happen to the Arab world and the Muslim world. And uh, so there is a lot of Islamist movement that, at their basis, they have a complete rejection of Western, what sometimes referred to as Western values and modernization. And also, when, when you have a, when you have an ecosystem that in the region right now, in which you have major powers like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Qatar they all need each other to grow because each group claiming to be defending you from the other group. So you have Sunni militias defending you from Hezbollah and Hezbollah defending you from Sunni militias. So all of them need each other to grow and to continue to exist. And as I said, so Iran needs Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia needs Iran. So, so, that, that is, so that in order for, as my organization is focused on problem solving, um, so we consider ourselves action tank, so we we research and do action based on the research that we have developed. Also, uh, g borrowing research from other think tanks and, and major researchers. And, and our major claim in our theory of change, sometimes referred to in the, in the, in the non-profit world, is that if more people have access to the information in their societies available in their own language that are not being provided by the authoritarian regimes uh, that, that many of these societies live in, I think that many people within the youth will be, are less likely to be introduced to dog, dogmatism and, more, and then become extremist and then be recruited by an extremist group. So that's why when I mentioned in the mission of the organization is that we are a prevention organization. There's a multiple organizations focused on counter extremism. There is called de-radicalization organizations where are focused on preventing somebody from, be, from who is an Islamist becoming a violent Islamist and there are groups of our, our group, so if you look at extremism as spectrum, 10 being ISIS, zero being a cultural Muslim or ex-Muslim, um, the, the ma majority of Muslims belong, uh, based on pure research in Gallup poll, belong between five and six. So they're not ISIS and they're not uh, super liberal. Um, but, and there, so our organization is focused on the beginning of the spectrum, is that how can we introduce ideas to people from their youth, from the beginning of their uh, intellectual development that they, they will not get by living in a closed society. Uh, while 
There are some other organizations like William, uh, William Foundation and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Uh, they try to prevent people who are already extremists uh, from be joining a terrorist group. So uh, from the total spectrum, most of our work complements the work of other organizations, but we um, focus a lot on the youth. And so that's the, the so as, as I mentioned is that, in, in my opinion, there is no incentive whatsoever for authoritarian regimes or theocrats to provide any form of critical thinking to their societies and most importantly to their youth because so they can easily control them and we can easily manipulate them. And, and so, th so as a result, so, so that is the failure. So there's no way that these people will do it. Then I think there is a room for or a niche market for other people to step in and do it. And now because of the internet as a, use, as a tool for technology, there's this famous quote by a friend, my friend, Mariam Namazi, who said the, the internet is doing to Islam what the printing press did to Christianity. Um, while some people might, might think that not historically true, considering that the Enlightenment were more complicated than just the introduction of the printing press. But it can definitely be said that the introduction of Enlightenment values into society has been able to move them towards less extremism and more um, diversity in, in their societies. And, and back to, to a bit of the history in which, so that's one of our major programs in our organization. So there is, there is a, a major project started in my hometown in Baghdad, which is called the House of Wisdom. And the House of Wisdom in which there were translators, scientists, everything from uh, who were sitting, living in, inside Baghdad, people from all over the world um, coming to, to Baghdad at the time. And then they have multiple manuscripts and, and scientific subjects from different languages were all being translated, being introduced to the, to the Arab society. And, and then you'll see that in that time, people in, inside Baghdad were, had, had both, both uh, people of ma male and female and also multiple faiths of ethnicities. So there is, um, so this is kind of, uh, of, of, of what it technically is. This is from the Muslim Heritage Organization in which ex explains what the House of Wisdom is. So it's, it was an academy of knowledge that was started in um, there. So, so as, as a solution, that? so that was the 13th century. So that was under Harun Rashid, uh, the Caliph Harun Rashid. And then, so at, at the time it was a private sector. It was only held inside the Caliph itself. But then his son Al Ma'mun moved it, he, uh, it's called, called open source. He moved it more to the, to the public and tried to involve more people from different parts of the world to be involved in that project. Um, so th th so for, for us as, a, as an organization is that what can we do to prevent uh, extremism from the beginning is in my opinion is to provide a positive narrative to Muslim youth and Arab youth. And, and in order not to be, and, and I think the reason why I have a strong belief in, in the program we are running because um, it's not necessarily antagonistic to many of the people within the Muslim world belief. So we're, we're mentioning that there is a great history within Muslim civilization that was more open to different set of ideas. And the more Muslim world was accepting of different ideas and different faiths, the more successful the Muslim w was. In the 13th century, the Arab world and the Muslim world expanded, expanded uh, a lot. And it's not an attack on the Islamic faith or the Muslim identity. And it's, it's in the, from the House of Wisdom and also from the case of Tunisia, it shows that there is a case that it is possible for Islam to be compatible with modernity and, and enlightenment values. And it's also important to incentivize many people within the Muslim youth to actually take responsibility and avoid victimhood mentality that always try to blame other people for their problems other than uh, folk, and having some self-reflection and learning from their history and, and trying to do something about it. So I think that we're giving them a task to do that, that we, they will be leaders of their own future and their own destiny. So we started a program called House of Wisdom 2.0. Uh, so named after the first House of Wisdom in, in 13th century. So the question is, so the, the mission is to promote the awareness and the enthusiasm of science and, and the knowledge about human rights in the face of tolerance, xenophobia, and violent extremism. And that if we are able to, to, to bring and foster this climate of education, climate of knowledge, climate of introduction, to, to ideas from other cultures as, as has been done in the 13th century, and most importantly, breaking the language barrier. I mean, I'm one of the few lucky ones, and so Shiri, uh, who are able to speak English fluently. I mean, I, my parents both studied in the UK. 
I, I, English was one of the first things that I've learned um, after, after eating with my both hands. I mean, I, was, I, st I studied English when I was eight years old, and uh, I was able to access most of the information and learn most of the information because of the pure privilege that my parents taught me English when I was young, and I was reading Thomas Paine and Carl Sagan when I was 12 years old. And that's uh, a unique story that doesn't happen in many parts of Iraq. Uh, and I think one of the main, main reasons is that breaking the language barrier, and also what we're doing in our organization is to create these short videos, uh, very animated, that try to reach with the young people um, as a kind of a hook, because not many people are book readers, not many people enjoy reading a book from beginning to the end of 400 pages. But if we can give them synopsises about the book, make it animated, make it engaging, make it fun, um, we, we have, I mean, working with our partners in many parts of the region, we, we break to 20 million viewership, 30 million viewership in some of our videos. So, because we're introducing these ideas in a much more entertaining way, uh, short. And then if, if some people, so based on our statistics is that of, of every million viewership, uh, only 10% get hooked, hooked, I mean 100,000 get hooked to read an article about the subject that we list on the beginning of the video. And about 5% of that 10% are downloading the book to read it from uh, beginning to the end. So let's say from a 1 million viewership of a video, um, you get roughly about maybe 1,000 people who would read uh, Carl Sagan or others. But 1,000 people can also influence other 1,000 people if they, if they know these ideas straight. But at the same time, a million people were introduced to an idea they probably never heard of before. What is like to be the pale blue dot? What is the importance of the universe? How do we exist? These questions that many people need to be struggling with, I think, in my opinion, because if there's one thing important in life is knowing to know why you exist and being introduced to different set of ideas and thinking for yourself is one of the best privileges. So this is Ideas Beyond Borders. This, thank you so much for listening, and I'm more happy to answer other questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it took me, it took me, this, this project took me a year to build, but uh, it's, it's gaining some momentum now. Sir, I'm sure you have some. Oh, I just want to wait for other people. I always have questions, but I have a rule that the student should ask the first question. That's true. Said just out of curiosity, uh, like, what what's the what's the actual situation like um, in Iraq? And I know you said that that, that was, uh, if I understood you correctly, that was going to be like a largely digital effort. Um, and you know, like me, you know, I've got an iPad, I've got a computer at home. Is is it is it that like every household has a computer with an internet connection? Surely not. Definitely, yeah, yeah. And, and could you just kind of expand on that a little more and, and, and how that's going to work? Because obviously, you know. So the question is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, it's about distribution, right? Is like w how many people will have the access to that knowledge in that and, these countries? And how difficult is that process for, you know, just, just the average person over there um, to, you know, they can't just go down to the So I mean, so every country has is is a different compared to other. But but to to answer the question with Iraq, um, I mean, a significant amount of people in the south of Iraq have almost no access to to uh, at least a computer. They might have a smartphone, uh, but reading reading a book on a smartphone is not easy. And and, and that being said, um, I mean, based upon our statistics, based on our partnerships, that the way that we do our distribution is that. We have, I, I have connections with the major 
social media, include also traditional media companies across the Arab world. And the, the, the total number of followers of many of these pages combined is about roughly 35 to 40 million followers. That is all across the Arab region. Um, in Iraq, we, there are 1.2 million followers. Um, the ages are between 15 to 35. Um, and so, so the population of Iraq is roughly about 35 million. And it's one of the youngest populations in the region. So there are obviously more young people than 1.8 million or 1.2 million. So um, I think, I mean, as a small organization, we're starting with what is the safe space. And the safe space is those who are more tech oriented, know how to use Facebook and Twitter, have know a bit about the scene in which uh, that these tools can be also used to get knowledge, not just to post cat videos or your view eating kebab. Uh, so, um, I mean, there are obviously more Facebook users in Iraq than there are, there are 1.2 million. I mean, Iraq, for Saudi Arabia, Twitter is one of the most uh, used apps. In Iraq, Facebook still has some momentum. Um, so, I mean, in Iraq, we also have, I mean, there's a place called Shara al-Mutanabbi, which is a place that many people buy books. Uh, one of our plans for next year is to move towards the physical space and actually try to uh, get the get the books sold out there. Um, fortunately, there are some like, good news when it comes to that, is that some publishing houses inside Iraq, one of major ones called Maktab al-Sutur, which is, which is in, inside Baghdad, are very much open to publish books related to controversial subjects. Um, it, it's, I mean, so there is a kind of a momentum right there. One of the also good things about the Iraq is the government is not strong enough, so that also gives you, I mean, you get some suicide bombers here and there, uh, but, but it's a trade-off, you know? Um, and so what happens is that even if these publishing houses um, distribute these books on a physical level, so you don't need to have access to the internet and many of these things, um, and next year, hopefully, we will actually move to the physical space. Uh, as we speak right now, there is Baghdad International Book Festival uh, happening inside, and, and some of the books that are, can, I mean, for people like Bernard Russell and, and others, are being displayed over there, so and without any persecution from the government, which is which is uh, good in some cases. Um, so Iraq is kind of a, a, a good case by by comparison. Is that and in Iraq also the internet is more free by comparison to other parts of the region, Syria, in which the intelligence pretty much knows everything you do. Um, countries like I mean the most difficult country that we have difficulty even reaching out to is Yemen um, because of the constant war. Most people have hardly an access to the internet, leave aside having some time to watch a science video. So Yemen is the most difficult. Um, Iraq is, I would say, in, in the middle because many people have access to, to, to the internet. But, and, uh, um, and there is kind of this culture. There's also another group that we, we have partnership with. It's called Ana Araqi Ana Aqra. I happen to know the, the head of it. Um, and they're trying to foster the culture of reading inside Baghdad, and they're more of an offline group, a uh, bunch of young people meeting with each other, reading a book, discussing a book, book discussion, all of that. So Iraq have kind of, I would say, is a good case by comparison. Lebanon, I've been in touch recently with the Lebanon Reading Society. They have events every, I think, every two weeks. They talk about books that are, some of them are controversial. They talk about the banned books. Lebanon also has some flexibility when it comes to information. Um, and uh, Morocco and other parts of Northern Africa, um, except Egypt, Egypt is a, is a, is a more authoritarian and, and the internet is really censored. And sometimes publishing or quote unquote promoting ideas that are um, controversial may get you in jail. Um, there, there's a recent case of a video blogger, his name is Sharif Gaber. Uh, possibly he's gonna be arrested uh, by the Egyptian government. Um, well, a case in Northern Africa, like Morocco, as I mentioned, Tunisia and, and Algeria, um, they are also more open to, so they, in Tunisia, they have a free thinker society. Um, and I think the same with Morocco. Uh, so that doesn't get any real heat from the government? Well, not the government. I mean, there, there are some societal pressures. Um, I mean, get death threats here and there, and there might be some people who would be willing to move towards that. But uh, these people are tough. I mean, some of the young people I've talked to, I mean, they make me look like a coward, uh, which I am. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't claim to be the biggest fighter in the world, but uh, like, I mean, some of them are really willing to sacrifice their life for this, uh, 
Uh, and also, like we're talking about a region that is very intense, so many people are intense, <laughs> so they would be willing to do it to the maximum. Um, so, I mean, there is, so there, as I said, so there is a market, there's a big market, and uh, the only thing that is missing, and I think why we mostly exist, uh, if there's one big element that exists, is number one, like many of the US publishing houses and most of the knowledge we have today um, that are available in the West, do not trust many of these kind of young, 20-year-old, 30-year-old kids who have a small publishing house inside Baghdad. So we are being the middleman because we are a US-based, New York-based organization. And so we have all that Fifth Avenue address and, and uh, the main reasons to be respected. And we have a law firm that is, that is giving us pro bono services and we do all of these things in the most professional manner. Uh, many publishing houses uh, respect us and trust us more because we are I mean, all of my board members live in the U.S. and are American, so we're becoming more of a middleman. So in that way, we become the we get the legal free the Arabic license for Arabic like copyright acquisition for the Arabic language, and then we spread it over there. And that way, because that's one of the main obstacles. When even like every time I talk to many of these young people, they say like I send this uh, email to Simon Schuster, and they told me to go fuck myself, <laughs> and uh, and I'm like okay. I'll, I'll, let me see if I can deal with it. And uh, this is so. This is one of the main obstacles that these people face. So we, so we, we become the middleman for them. And I think, I think there's, as I said, big market in all the countries, except Yemen and Somalia and some of these extremely war-torn countries. It's, it's almost impossible to get any of the data over there. So I did have a question about so the selection of the works. I mean, obviously, translating the work. Yeah. And there's a voluminous amount of possible books or articles that you can translate. So you mentioned Sam Harris. And uh, you know, my reaction to sort of the contemporary new atheists is that this is my own view, kind of rather shallow in, in their analysis of their understanding of religion. I mean Bertrand Russell I think was far more sophisticated in his understanding of religion than some of the modern atheists. And if I want to make an argument, I, and by the way, I love the idea of diverse critical thinking, diverse education, critical thinking, getting people reading stuff, you know, science, rationalism, enlightenment thought, um, and, uh, you know, Voltaire, whatever, right? But if you want to make a pitch to a traditional society, an Islamic society, there are lots of, you know, great works that promote free thought, religious freedom, liberties, human rights even, within Islamic thought. And, uh, you know, Mustafa Akil, well, yeah, yeah. Streams, yeah, yeah. there's uh, uh, another scholar, his name escapes me right now, but... Uh, Amina would do it. Uh, Amina would do it, the feminist Quran, okay, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of people like that who, who are, you know, making great cases for liberty yeah, yeah. within the Islamic context. And I'm wondering, would that be more, uh, I don't know, a better strategy than just sort of, I don't know, just like Translating publishing Western it. publishers. That instead, of, instead, of, instead of translating Western yeah. books, yeah, like, like just promotes yeah. the, promotes yeah, the yeah, Because there's a perception that, that the West wants to undermine us. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that when we promote religious freedom, we're really promoting secularism or promoting, you know, uh, materialism or hedonism or whatever, right? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Amazing question. Um, I mean, so we have we have advisory board that also be engaged in our selection. Um, Nadia Awaidat from New America Foundation. Um, also, she did her PhD on Arab liberalism. So here's, here's my, my answer. I think that I agree with you that, that it's much more likely to convert somebody who likes Coke to drink Pepsi. I mean, that's a pure marketing strategy uh, in sales. And, it's, and, and none of our goal is actually to promote people to take the Sam Harris or atheist. I mean, we're not an atheist organization or promoting atheism. That being said, um, so I've, I have done extensive interviews with many former extremists. And, and actually, I met one just two days ago here in Oklahoma City who gave a talk at the American Atheist Convention. And, uh, who happens to, like some of his cousins joined Al-Qaeda and they, uh, they like, went to Fallujah and fought. 
And, and my, one of my main conversations with him was like, okay, so what really changed you? Like, you, you, I mean, you from a, a, a guy from Jordan who didn't grow that far from Al Zarqawi neighborhood, like the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. And he said, what I needed was like a big shock, punch in the face, uh, metaphorically, uh, not advocate for violence here. But uh, what, I, what I needed was kind of like a big shock, punch in the face approach that because I was that much sticking to, to uh, conservative in my, in my belief. And it, it, his case was Richard Dawkins, not Sam Harris. But he said that just reading like the God delusion and, and like hearing that all of that is complete worthless and all of my beliefs are complete worthless was really what, what like gave me the shock enough to be able to read Mustafa Eichel and to read other um, more, let's say, compatible with Islam. Um, so, um, so I found that, I mean, I've, I've heard that over like maybe, I can I definitely I would love to send you some names of the people who, who have told me kind of similar answer that, um, that they needed that kind of shock factor kind of information because they live in societies that are too conservative and they think that those who speak nice are faking it. You know, so they think that those who, who are, uh, trying to be no, but there are something beautiful over there. But I don't want to offend you. Uh, they think that these people like have something to sell you. And I was ta ta talking more to the former for the former extremist, and, he, and I told him like, how about these other books like of of people like Raza Aslan, let's say, or uh, yeah, and and any of the books that are let's say let's call it not antagonistic to religion, but rather try to. And he was like, I find all these people to be like salesmen. They they. They, they, I don't, I want, I want someone who quote unquote tells it like it is. Um, and so I, while I mean, on, on an overview of our organization in terms of translation, we choose the books that are not antagonistic and, 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 and try to show that there is a great history and there is, uh, but at the same time, I think there's a still room for, and also, I mean, the reason why we exist also to some extent is that I mean, the books that are not controversial, let's say the books that are more compatible, can be tr translated legally in Iraq. I mean, there is no, there is no, uh, I mean, if, if a book is saying Islam is beautiful, everything is great, then there, I mean, any, any major publishing houses inside Baghdad can do it. I mean, the, the Iraqi government is not going to burn them alive. But it is that those who are not uh, being published in, in, in the region by the legal way uh, would leave a room for us. So. So uh, yeah, so that's I mean I, I I mean from a pure logical standpoint, you what you're saying makes couple of sense. That is um, fascinating. I didn't know it. Yeah. Um, it sort of makes sense when there was somebody who could just say something so outrageous, like you know, religion's all awful. It's a, all right. Yeah. It's so shocking. To the way that, that yeah, so like when you live uh, uh, there's this uh, I mean I would love you send send you this video. There's this very famous. Uh, Egyptian video blogger, his name is Ahmed Harqan, and he has two episodes saying like this, my story of conversion. Um, in Arabic, I, probably would, I think it would be amazing to put English subtitles to introduce many people to it. And he was, a f he is a former Salafist who was, like his brother I think flew to join ISIS. Like he's that, he's that type of like close violent Salafist group. And it was like, I think it, it was probably a Sam or, it was like that sh like shock factor because he was like going to fly to Syria in two weeks or something, like something that was very immediate. And it was that shock factor was like, uh oh, this like, okay, there, like I've never heard that before. This is like causing some, uh, some <laughs> brain confusion. And that brain confusion is, uh, is one way. Uh, but but, I, but I, I agree with you from pure logical standpoint, you would wanna, um, I mean in sales, we, we, we were taught this concept that like if you, want to, if you are selling uh, Pepsi, you, you, you can easily move a Coke drinker to a Pepsi drinker than to move a Pepsi drinker to a champagne drinker. Because you are moving from two similar concepts, but I, I think with, uh, which makes complete sense. Because if somebody doesn't, let's say, drink alcohol, we're not, not gonna sell them Heineken. You're not gonna do targeted ass of Heineken to somebody who drinks, uh, who probably even doesn't drink alcohol. So, so, but, but I think with, with this world of, of, of ideas, so sometimes the shock factor can play a role. I, would, I mean, we don't necessarily endorse 
uh, these ideas, but I think g getting the Arab youth, and, and hopefully we can expand to Persian and Urdu and other languages, to all that diversity of, of, of knowledge and getting all, get them to access all these books. I mean, ideally we would really recreate the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and make it this, uh, the same as was, which I assume had a, a big diversity of knowledge as well, uh, which also involved people like the Mu'tazilites and uh, reformers or people who didn't believe that Muhammad was a real prophet, but Allah exists. There were all these discussions inside. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the, prom promoting like all that diversity from the aggressive to the mild to the super spicy to the less spicy uh, was definitely the goal. Another question on that is, so it sounds like mostly what you're talking about is trying to combat extremism in the Middle East by bringing more ideas and making more ideas accessible in the Middle East. But uh, when, when you have a lot of people, and like a lot of the, like the quote, homegrown terrorists in the West are like second or third generation. So they have had, they've grown up with a lot more access to information. Is that kind of a totally different sort of extremism from the kind that's going on in the Middle East as a whole? or? Is there actually a common thread there? Well, there are multiple uh, answers to this. Um, it is, it, there, I mean, based on, I mean, there's a, uh, the Center for Extremism by George Washington University. They do amazing research on homegrown Islamic, Islamist terrorism uh, that you, you, uh, and you, you can check out. And um, from my understanding, and that's purely my opinion of the differences, in, when, you're, when you're living as a Muslim in a Muslim majority country, you don't have an identity problem. Everyone around you believes the same thing and, and, and kind of like, you don't have any form of identity struggle. Like I'm Iraqi, I'm surrounded by Iraqis my whole time. Uh, they speak the same language, we have similar culture. And I'm not, I, I never had a struggle with my identity. And I only have struggle with my identity when I'm probably like in, I don't know, in the farmland, anywhere. Put me anywhere in the farmland and I will have an identity crisis because I grew up most of my life in cities. So I'm like, okay, what I'm doing here? But um, so, so, but if you are uh, uh, like a, uh, any minority, let's say, uh, growing up in a different majority, and then you are faced with, let's say, racism from, from the majority, or um, then you will have, there's a different struggle. Uh, their concept of my people and their people is very different when you live in a country in which you are the majority, in which you are the minority. Uh, one of the famous cases of homegrown extremism is my friend Majid Nawaz, right? So Majid is born in the UK. His parents are moderates. Uh, I've met his parents, wonderful family. I've met his sister. And uh, so what happened was he was not taught extremism by his own family. His family is, but what happened was he grew up in Essex. And that was a time in which there was a rise of skinheads who, who go and attack brown people, quote unquote. And so there's a guy who listens to hip hop most of the time would be considered in the moderate category. Then he got beaten up by skinheads. And then there is always this charming recruiter of an Islamist organizations like Hazbit Tahrir, like others, who come in and says, see the West, they are attacking you. This is what they are. I know somebody like you who was beaten up like this. I know exactly how you're, how you're feeling. Then so, so then it's like you as a, let's say, a brown immigrant, or actually he's not an immigrant, he's a second generation, right? Um, then you, you don't feel you're part of British society because you, and then there's all this charming recruiter who's trying to take you to the mosque every, every week and trying to brainwash you in this concept. But that is not the same in, in, in many countries. across. We, we, don't have, we don't have skinheads, number one. <laughs> um, and we, we don't have this identity identity struggle that many second generation, third generation deals with. And for, for in Iraq, I mean, in many countries in which ISIS others grow, I mean, there's so much, I mean, there's the, the, the culture itself has a lot of extremism. You have, for example, like after the, the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein said some, uh, created something that faith campaign, Alhamdulillah Imani, introducing lots of Salafist ideology to many of the, of the madrasas, like the Islamic schools in Iraq. And it's not surprised that some of them ended up joining ISIS. It's not surprised that some of the generals who were leading the Iraq army under Saddam's time, when they felt after the dismantling of the Iraq army after the Iraq, Iraq war, and then the rise of the Shia expansionist government, and then they felt so polarized in the way that they, many of them joined. I mean, how do you think ISIS were able to occupy the countries of Great Britain? It was not 
just bunch of ideologues thinking of how to create a caliphate. They had a lot of military capability, all of that. So it's a very different animal dealing with extremism. In my, I mean, that's my own extreme opinion. I mean, I might be wrong, but the folks who are growing up in the West facing a lot of questions about existence and identity and minority majority, even though they have all the access to information compared to all the other. Um, actually, there was an amazing uh, story at Deutsche Welle, the DW, about Syrian refugees coming to Germany. And they said, the, Syria, the mosques here in Germany are more extreme than the one that I grew up with in Syria, which was very interesting. Like, so Germany, which is a liberal, liberal democratic state for the most part, right? Um, the, the, probably the second generation, third generation mosque attendees in Germany are more extreme than the mosque attendees from the country in the Middle East. So, so there, I think it's a much different, uh, like there is a di different extremism in both, both places. M different internal politics, geopolitics, uh, all of that. It's a, in different regions. Also, you know, not, genuine Nazism is kind of bubbling up below the surface. There was a movie called Look Who's Back, which was ended as a satire that was made a couple of years ago. But they, part of it was kind of reality show life where they would go out and they had the movie was about Hitler was somehow teleported into the future from the, the bunker. When, but and they go out and they interview Germans and said, "This is Hitler," and I guess people know it's got to be an actor, but. They start talking about, yeah, yeah, you know, the Hitler is a great guy. And so there, that's still there, very yeah, yeah, yeah. right under the surface. And then, you know, if, if there are conflicts between, you know, the, the Islamic people who are there, especially the youth, like you were saying, and, and the young neo Nazis, you know, if they get harassed like that, that could be, you know, you can see that's potentially a radicalizing element for the German mosques. I mean, I, 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 about seven months ago, I gave a talk, a Danish government uh, a meeting called the Soro meeting. And in, uh, in Copenhagen, so Copenhagen is 40 minutes away from Malmo. Malmo, Sweden is a central place for a lot of Islamic extremism. I mean, lots of place of many Muslim immigration as well as Islamic extremism there. And... So what, what, I mean, what, what's happening, and, and one of the many elements that I've mentioned that in the talk is that, so you, I mean, the case with Europe is, is that many of the states are, to some extent, built on tribes, right? Danish, Denmark, French, France, uh, Swedish, Sweden, German, German. Even though these things have changed, right? Like after World War I, Hungary was cut off from Germany and there was a new country. But there is a sense of connection to the land that the states... I mean, the concept of an ethnostate to some extent in Europe. So you have, you have an identity that is mixed up to the land. And, and then, you, so that is a ve that's a very strong identity. And then, you have, so there, so, and then you have a group of people coming from, let's say, majority of Muslim countries, who some of them have also a very strong conservative identity. So you have conservative identity, like a strong identity here, strong identity here. They immediately clash is that both of them are not willing to compromise whatsoever. And most importantly, those who came from outside are not willing to compromise whatsoever. So, um, I mean, in Germany, I mean, the AFD party, which is the one of the far right, have won some, some votes, and now they're negotiating with Merkel to actually reduce immigration and, and refugee, refugees. Um, as in the case of many con Europe, in, in Austria, the, the party which was the anti-immigration was, I think, lost by 0.2%. Uh, which is also the, one of the far-right parties in, inside Austria, which is a country that's highly educated. So, I mean, I'm not, when I was in, in Europe, and I'm going back again in, in Brussels in June, um, I'm not really optimistic about the future of Europe. I mean, from both sides. I mean, the rise of, the rise, of, uh, because and there's an ama amazing book, I'm trying to remember, it's by um, a woman called Julia, who's a researcher at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. And she wrote this book, uh, it's called Rage, which is how the far right and Islamist extremists feed into each other. Um, very amazing book uh, about 
how like so uh, uh, so the neo Nazis and the Islamists need each other for survival. As I mentioned, to some extent in the region, Hezbollah needs ISIS and Assad needs ISIS, and and there's all this ecosystem of extremism that would would need each other to succeed. And and the, and the neo Nazis are always waiting for another story in which some women, white women, were raped by Muslim migrants, and then the the the, these guys are waiting for neo-Nazis to beat up, uh, take up a hijab of a Muslim woman and then beat her, beat her cousin in the street. So the, all of these people are looking forward to each other. And then you have, and, and that's also another extreme opinion that I have. Um, is, here in the US, but yeah. Um, and, and I think that social media, and that might sound like a, like a crazy opinion, I think social media has helped creating kind of a world that is more polarized than it is, and then getting more people more polarized. So, so I mean, there are so I mean, so many things like um, I mean, I don't know if you believe in the Russian intervention. I do. I think that Russia has intervened at least in the social media aspect. I don't know if they hacked the elections, but they have intervened there. And what was really interesting is that they were boosting posts related to like Black Lives Matter. Uh, doing some bad stuff in Ferguson, Missouri. At the same time, they were boosting posts related to like neo-Nazis, thousands, ten thousands of neo-Nazis. Even though the article is fake, and there's probably only ten hundred neo-Nazis. And then getting all these two sides of the aisle completely outraged that there is like the end of the world is happening, and we have to arm up right now and defend ourselves. And I have seen the same case happening in lots of the. Muslim, um, uh, uh, like far right, for example, one of the cases uh, in, in New York, um, and there was this case that a woman, uh, Egyptian woman, I think her age is about 19 or 20, and then the claim was that there was a Trump supporter came in the Grand Central, as one of the most famous cities in the city, and then he took her hijab off at Grand Central, and and uh, then outrage was all there, like look at Trump supporters. Hating on Muslims and all trouble man. Guess what was the real story? The Egyptian girl had the dates, an Irish Catholic guy, and they went on a date with him. And then she passed the curfew. So uh, her parents are conservative Muslims, and they had a curfew on her. So what she had to do, she had to lie to the NYPD, saying that she was beaten up by Trump supporters. And at the beginning when that story was happening, I have seen tons of Muslim organizations look at how New York is Islamophobic and racist, and then there was the other people saying, no, Trump supporters are, are not are innocent, and these are fake news. So there was like maybe 10,000 Facebook posts made about really a story of a girl wanted to hook up with a dog and didn't work out well, and she had to go back home and pass the curfew. And imagine how many cases in Europe happening in which uh, some of the things are actually exaggerated in terms of, and then you have f Facebook app and then you have Twitter app that are really focused on making you happy and outraged as much as possible so you can buy more products and you have targeted advertising um, and then will lead to a more polarized society. I mean, that's one of my extreme views. I think that social media have... Same way, you know, for the conservatives, it says, here's, here's a liberal doing, stupid liberal doing something really dumb. Look how dumb they are. And then it shows them 10 more videos to that. And it all started with the targeted marketing, exactly like you said. You yeah. Know, that's the same reason why, you know, you're looking for a cordless drill and suddenly like every web page shows you an ad for a cordless drill. And the, the, they're trying to show you what you want to see, but when it slips over <coughs> from, the, from the advertising into the, into the, to the interest, yeah, yeah. You know, what trying to show you what you want to see, it serves as as an inflammatory effect, fanning you know the flames of your own. And, it, it, and like I said, even before they started talking about this on the media, I was seeing it. I was seeing how I was reacting to what Facebook was showing me, and I thought, well, is this? I mean, it seems like it's intensifying my prejudices <laughs> and, and, and fanning my, you know, rather than than cultivating a sense of. Uh, perspective. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and then, yeah, you have more. I mean, YouTube is the same thing. It's like the moment you enter, like, one video, on, and then you go in the dark, dark web. Like, not dark web, but the, <laughs> but the black hole. And, and then you see, like, a crocodile eating a black guy. And, like, out of a sudden, like, the whole video is like, going so crazy. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to see my share with you my YouTube history. But, but uh, like, there's, like, I mean, it, I mean but in a, in, a, in a funny, I mean, in a funny way, that also benefited me, right? Like, for example, Many people who have seen, let's say, Majid Nawaz, know Majid Nawaz because we know each other. They also get to know about me. So it's like it's it's it, it can't be. It really can't be a. Um, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, many of these technologies are double-edged sword, and and sometimes now it's used. I mean, there is this um, methodology being used. I think now they're being used on cults, um, and what they do is that so they figure out where like some of the cults mean meet. Sorry. And then they do like geolocation advertising. So let's say you are part of uh, like equivalent like Jim Jones style cult in which uh, that mostly like violent or asking people to kill themselves. So they, they, somebody goes and know where they made and then they put a geolocation. And then what happens is that when somebody is, that, is in that location and you open your Facebook or your Twitter, you will have as targeted towards you as a counter extremism, uh, as a counter extremism uh, tool. It's, it's, it's now developing the geolocation, called geolocation, extreme, like geolocation counter extremism, in which like you pinpoint one of the places where some extremists meet or some criminals meet, and then when you are in that location multiple times, they know that you're a regular to that area, they're gonna send you targeted advertising on the goal that that will shift you away from crisis. So yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, the, <laughs> that's my field, it's not, it's not that fun, but... but um, Yeah, yeah, and they, the crazy increase, education spending, yeah. In Costa Rica, I think it was like the late 40s, 48, 49, they had a very, very corrupt civilian government. And so the general of the army overthrew the civilian government and then immediately held elections to elect a new government and then disbanded the military and took the money from the military and put it into education and, you know, public works and, 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 and made Costa Rica into a prosperous, literate nation. Yeah. As opposed to just a dictatorship at a time. I, that's, I mean, the thing is like with many dictatorships is that it's, it's, some of it really depends a lot on luck. Is that, I mean, in Iraq we had a dictatorship and, and Tunisia had a dictatorship, but the way that operates, these dictatorships operate are very, I mean, very different. And also look at the case, for example, Singapore. Singapore is led by a dictatorship, Lee Kuan Yew uh, and his people party. Uh, I, I think is that Singapore is rated the f after China or Russia when it comes to freedom of speech. And, and they have the Wall Street Journal section that is only on finance. They don't allow many of the newspapers that are talk anything about politics. Uh, they have one of their funny newspapers, which is I think the official government, is that like the prime minister of Singapore met with the president of France and they discussed things related to Singapore and France. <laughs> that's, that's really an article, that's like an opinion piece um, in, in, uh, in, in Singapore. Even though Singapore is one of the most prosperous countries in the world, um, high GDP, highly educated, um, and, but it is, not, it is not in any sense a free society. It's, and, and so, but it's, so, I mean, dictatorships, I mean, that's actually, I had kind of this discussion and debate about this at the, at the Cato Institute or Students for Liberty, and there's this major hypothesis with Milton Friedman, the the, the econo economist, who said that political free economic freedom leads to political freedom. That if you have this, it's a precondition. And and Singapore is like one of the countries that proved that hypothesis to be wrong. Is that you can have a country highly economically free but not politically free at all, and um, it, even with uh, many like it's it's. In Iraq, we actually had neither, right? We had neither economic freedom or political freedom. It's the same case with Syria, not the same, uh, at, but at least with some dictatorships, they allow some sort of, of, of uh, uh, social freedom compared to others. Uh, there's a, a great, book, great book that I recommend called Dictatorships Evolve. It talks about how dictatorships, even though they are, they are dictators, but they try to use liberal language uh, and try to create the illusion of an uh, election, like, as Vladimir Putin does frequently. Um, and so dictatorships 
also evolve as time goes by. And they try to create an illusion of some social freedom and while in fact they curb on others and then people say, well, but he's giving us this social freedom. Why should I join? Why should I risk it and go to the other side who might not give me that freedom? So th it's a very great book. Like talks about like differences between how dictatorships evolve and stuff. I think that was great. And you're talking about. I think it might depend on the the, the intentions of the of the, the dictator. If the dictator is just out for self-aggrandizement, then you have you know a completely wide separation of income. But if you have a dictator who seems to be intent on improving the lives of everyone. For instance, that reminds me of Yugoslavia in the Cold War era, where it was Josip Broz Tito was the dictator who had made a, a, a sense of distance from the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc while still being a part of it. But at the same time, he had all these, and he, but he ruled with an iron fist, but at the same time, apparently fairly fairly. And when he died, then that's when Yugoslavia kind of devolved and broke up and became because it, it took a firm hand to keep all of those different yeah. factions and ethnicities kind of playing by the same book. And then when he, he died and he was no longer there, then things broke apart and we had the, you know, the anarchy and the, all the warfare and civil war that they had during the 1990s. I mean, that's a bit, Turkey is another example. Now I'm reminded is, I mean, Turkey, Ataturk was also an example of uh, ruling the country with an iron fist. And, and I mean, Turkey for ages, always been used as an example as a compatibility between Western values and Islam and, and kind of their position. And now with, with Erdogan, I mean, they, they have uh, moving more towards a conservative regime that is at the same time ethnic. So they fought, they, I mean, Kur Turkey even fights against Islamist Kurdish groups, even though both of them are Islamist, but they are but they are uh, because of ethnic divides. They uh, so they have a religious ethnic divide that's ha now happening in the region. And after the last, I don't know what people call it, a coup d'état, but it's not necessarily a coup d'état, um, in which now like more journalists have been arrested than I think in Russia, uh, Turkey is, and also it was ruled. But that's why I think back to my, my talk a bit is that um, th so th these are one man's rule situations and the moment that person dies it's just because they hasn't built enough foundation so for example like well Kansas and Tunisia Porgebe died right but they continued because he educated the population he actually didn't uh, didn't like made it all about himself in a way that if he's uh, well in Iraq for example Saddam Mavis quote is that Saddam qal Iraq means if Saddam says Iraq says um, so there's a huge difference between somebody investing in education, so in that way he's technically building the last, next leaders of the country, while somebody wants to keep that all to himself, and, and then when he dies, uh, then almost everything goes, goes away. You see the opposite thing happening here in Oklahoma as far, at least as far as the education is concerned. Yeah, I, I've heard about the process. Several decades now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish I, I know more about the Oklahoma politics. I you know, <laughs> went for Trump like nobody else. And, and I was born and raised here, but I got a good education back in the day when I was in school. But yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. How much, I mean, do uh, you guys have any more questions? Yeah, I think, I think we're good. Okay. All right, then. Thank you very much. Thank you again.